Lord willing, this will all work without a hitch. And with Jared at the helm, what possibly could go wrong? Oh boy. What did we study last week? Well, we're in the book of Joshua, or Joshua. AJ? What did, we, what did we look at in the previous lesson? So, Larry? Uh, the judgment of Achan, the judgment of Israel because of Achan, and then the individual judgment of Achan. We talked about Achan's sin. We talked about his judgment. Uh, any, uh, did any of the finer points that were brought out? Jared? Not only Achan was affected by his sin, but his family, his possessions, like animals and stuff like that, and all of the nation of Israel were affected by Achan's sin. Anybody else? That has nothing to do with the last lesson. Uh, anybody else? All right. We look forward now to the battle of the second battle of AI. AI battle number one did not go particularly well. And I think um, today we're going to look at, I don't who's this belong to? Um, we look forward to the battle of, uh, the second battle of AI. I think, I think a, a way to look at this is, um, we're, we're going to put out two finer points in our application of what we're going to learn in this chapter to our own Christian life, um, and personal application is important when looking at every aspect of the, of the scripture. How, how does this affect me? How does this affect my, our modern day? And you could take, if, if you did not try that uh, in things that weren't directly addressed to Christians, uh, you could chuck most of the Bible out the window because some of it's not directed at you. You have to uh, discern uh, and use uh, spiritual guidance. Um, we talked a lot about battle in here and how that we're supposed to go forward. We're supposed to um, use the weapons and the um, abilities that God has given us to fight in His warfare. To and and, and moreover, to allow God to use us as His tool to fight in that warfare. And that's that's just a broad overview. Um, I think today is going to be a little bit more specific. So if we look in Joshua chapter eight, verse one. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, and arise and go up to Ai. See, I have given into thy hand the king of Ai, and his people, and his city, and his land. Now, uh, one big departure from the second battle of Ai, from the first battle of Ai, is this. God is doing some talking here. God, uh, God is... God is with the children of Israel on this fight. Uh, before, was there any, did anybody address the Lord God? Did anybody talk to him about, hey, what do you think about the battle? Like? Because I bet if Joshua had, the God would said, I I'm not pleased with y'all right now. They're sinning in your camp. But nobody, no, nobody brought God into this. And I think last week we talked a, a little bit about how oftentimes when we get into, uh, we, we win a battle, we get into it, and then we fall by the wayside, and then, we wonder why we're not gaining any more traction, why we're why we're losing fights against people, and this this is this is the reason right here. But this time the Lord is with him. He says, "Go up and take AI. We have given I've given all of it to you, and, and thou uh, and thou shalt do to AI and her king as thou didst in Jericho and her king. Only the spoil thereof and the cattle thereof shall ye take for prey for yourselves. Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it." So Joshua rose up 
and all the people of the war to go up against Ai. And Joshua chose out 30,000 men of valor and sent them away by night. And he commanded them, saying, Behold, ye shall lie in wait against the city, even behind the city. Go not uh, very far from the city, but be ye all ready. And I and all the people that are with me will approach unto the city. And it shall come to pass, when they come out against us, uh, as at the first, that we will flee before them. And, and for they will come out after us, till we have drawn them from the city. For they will say, They flee before us, as at the first. Therefore we, shall, uh, we will flee before them. And you shall rise up from an ambush, and seize the city. For the Lord your God will deliver it into your hand. So the plan for the battle of Ai was, was this. We're going to, we're going to send 30,000 men at night... And y'all are going to hang out behind the city. Subtly. I don't know how you subtly hide 30,000 people, but they did it. Um, and you're going to just wait. And when we and the rest of the people that are with me move forward, we're going to join battle with them. And then we're going to turn and run, just like last time. And they will chase us, just like last time. And when we are far enough from the city, you guys are going to take it without... Without a single, without a single drop of blood shed, because it's just going to be women and children left behind. And uh, this was, and I will point. This also was um, was God's plan. Verse two, He lays out and He said, "Lay thee an ambush for the city behind it." Now, the point I want to bring across today, and one of the points that I want to point out as we move through this chapter, is a lot of times when we go to do the work of the Lord, and I said we should we should be, we should actively be looking, we should actively be setting ourselves to battle for the Lord. As I've said before, we're described in the New Testament as warriors, as battle-hardened, or should be battle-hardened warriors for the Lord. We should be going to war, but just saying, let's go to war, that, that's, that's a very small piece. If you told an army, go to war, they, they wouldn't know what to do. You have to have direction, you have to have a plan. And that's what I want to point out today, is that a lot of times we go to battle, we set ourselves up to do, I'm going to do the work of the Lord, whatever it is, whatever your personal, when I say that, whatever pops to your head, whenever I say that, think about, it, we're going to go to war, that's, that's your warfare, that's your battlefield. But a lot of times we go to whatever that particular activity that you're thinking of is, with no plan. With, with, with no idea on how to accomplish what we're doing. Has any army ever moved without a plan? Moved without direction? Moved without, uh, I'm sure a lot of those old time World War II type films and even some modern films that are, that are set in a past time period, you have those big maps. Usually it's of you know a, a particular theater if it's if it's the European if you're World War II European theater or or the Pacific theater and they've got those long sticks and they're moving uh, troops around the map and they're and they're, as they're getting updated information they're moving enemy troops around where they think they're at on this big map why because they need a plan they need to know where all the little pieces are so that whenever it's time to set to battle. All, we have all the information, and a lot of times I think we go into spiritual battle with zero information about what we're supposed to do, with no plan on how, it, not only do we not have any information, but no plan once we get there. We just show up. We show up with no forethought. We show up with, a lot of times, without praying, without, I mean, God was with them here, but we show up a lot of times like Joshua's people did to the first battle of Ai, with no power of God, no plan, no information whatsoever, and we get whipped every single time. So let's continue. Um, uh, verse 8, And it shall be, when ye have taken the city, that ye shall set the city on fire, according to the commandment of the Lord, shall ye do. See, I have commanded you. Joshua therefore sent them forth, and, the, and they went to lie in ambush between Bethel and Ai, on the west side of Ai. But Joshua lodged at night among the people, and Joshua rose up early in the morning and numbered the people and went up, he and the elders of Israel before the people to Ai, and all the people, even the people of war that were with him, went up and drew nigh, and, it, uh, and came before the city and pitched on the north side of Ai. Now there was a valley between them and Ai, and he took about 5,000 men and set them to lie in ambush between uh, Bethel, and Ai on the west side of the city, and when they had set the people, even all the hosts that was on the north side of the city, and their liars and wait on the west side of the city, Joshua went into the uh, went that night into the midst of the valley, and it came to pass when the king of Ai saw it, they hasted and rose up early 
And the men of the city went out against the people of Israel, he and all, all his people, at the time appointed before the plain, and he wist not that there were liars in ambush against him behind the city. And Joshua and all Israel made as if they were beaten before them and fled out of the way into the wilderness. So, in the morning, the battle is set in array. And it is, it is important. I think the Bible never leaves out anything that is important to us. It also says that the king of Ai had no idea that this plan was set. We go to make a plan. We do the plan according to what God has said. And, and, and let, me, let me make this abundantly clear. A lot of time it's not going to be your plan. It's going to be God's plan. Uh, I, I, I meant to make that point earlier, but I'll go ahead and make it now. A lot of times it's going to be God. This was God's plan. God's plan was for them to ambush them. God's plan was for them to use subterfuge. And God's plan was working out. The people of, the people of Ai completely oblivious to everything that was going on around them. And, of course, the first thing they did early in the morning. See, uh, it, when we go to battle... I think I think we 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 forget because because we're we're Christians and we and we deal with conflict in our bodies and our spirits so often. Lost people are very predictable. <laughs> that, that that you know what what they will do nine times out of ten follow the flesh. And if they're not doing that, they're doing that because of either some lawful or predisposed morality that they have been taught. And they're only doing that because it's the social convention to do so. They're very predictable. And the people of Ai were very predictable. They said, here are the children of Israel again. Let's go do battle again. And they run down through there. And the, and the ambushers are like, y'all have fun. We're going to take this city. <laughs> we're going to do the thing. Um, and all the people that were in Ai were called together to pursue after them. And they pursued after Joshua and were drawn away from the city. And there was not a man left in Ai or Bethel that went out after Israel. And they left the city open. And pursued after Israel, and the Lord said unto Joshua, Stretch out thy sp uh, the spear that is in thine hand toward Ai, for I will give it into thine hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that he had in his hand toward the city, and the ambush rose quickly out of their place, and they ran as soon as he had stretched out his hand, and entered into the city, and took it, and hasted, and set the city on fire. And when the men of Ai looked behind them and saw, behold, the smoke of the city ascended up to heaven, and they had no power to flee this way or that way, and the people that fled into the wilderness turned uh, back word upon the pursuers. The trap is set. The, 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 plan, the, the plan is in action. But I will point this out. Joshua was called upon by the Lord to do something very similar to someone else in the Scriptures. Does anybody know who, who and what I'm referring of? Test your biblical knowledge here. Joshua is called upon here to do something very similar. The stretching of the spears is called on to be do something very similar to someone else in the scripture. Sister John. Moses had to raise his staff over his head uh, until uh, to grant the people prevalence and victory. When his hands got tired and his hands drooped, the people started losing, and when his hands were above his head, and Joshua was said, the Lord said, stretch out the spear that's in your hand, and Joshua stood, and he stretched out the spear. The command stood, though, and I think we're fixing, we're going to see that here in just a second. Um, and, um, let's see, where was I at? Uh, 22. And, uh, and the other issued out of the city against them, so that they were in the midst of Israel, some on this side and some on, on that side. And they smote them, so that none of, uh, and let none of them remain or escape. And the king of Ai took, uh, they took alive and brought him to Joshua. And it came to pass when Israel had made an end of slaying and all the inhabitants of Ai in the field and in the wilderness wherein they chased them. And when they had all were fallen by the edge of the sword and until they were consumed, and all the Israelites turned and uh, returned unto Ai and smote it with the edge of the sword. And so it was uh, all that that uh, so it was all that day uh, all that fell that day, both of men and women were twelve thousand, even all the men of Ai. For Joshua drew not his hand back, wherewith he stretched out the spear until he utterly destroyed all the inhabitants of Ai. Joshua had the command, stretch forth your spear. And we would have taken this as, oh, the Lord was trying to give the ambushers a signal because the minute that he stretched forth his spear, what did the ambushers do? They, they took the city. They, they, they went in and they did their part of the plan. Joshua didn't take it as a, as a, as a one second, okay, up and then down. He didn't take it as a one second command. He stood on the battlefield 
spear raised. According to the scriptures, the entire time until everybody was slain. See, Joshua remembered. And it, 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 Joshua was I, he wasn't present with Moses when Moses was doing this. He was on the battlefield at the time. But Joshua, no doubt, remembered that battle and how and how the sway was set back and forth. And sometimes, and, and this is the next part of this this idea of making a plan, of following God's plan, of when you're doing the Lord's work, not just gallivanting around like you don't. Like a, like a chicken with his head cut off, like you don't know what's going on around you. The second part of this plan is not everybody has the same purpose. Joshua was a valiant warrior, an aged warrior, no doubt, but a valiant warrior nonetheless. His job on the battlefield that day was to hold a spear. How many... I, it doesn't really say any losses on Israel here, but... I'm assuming that there was that there was at least some injury. There was uh, the people of AI did just didn't just not fight back. <laughs> uh, they were they were they they were swinging swords and throwing spears too. How many people could have been spared injury? And if there were fa fatalities, how many people could have spared death? If Joshua was was there doing his warrior thing, fighting and stabbing and with his spear, no, Joshua was still on the battlefield. He held up a spear. And sometimes your job on the battlefield, on the battlefield of life, as, as a warrior for both this church and for the Lord, is going to seem infinitesimally small and silly. It's going to seem like, you're, like, like it is not something that is worthy of your time. It's your job, though, to do it, because I would dare say, if Joshua had dropped his hand, they might not have taken this battle. If Joshua had decided, you know what, I'm going to hold the spear up like God said, I'm going to follow the commandment of the Lord to the letter, but not the spirit of the, of the law, and just go back and fight, they may not have taken this city. We don't, uh, you know, coulda, shoulda, woulda. We don't know what, what would have happened in the scripture. We only know what did happen. Very good hypothetical, though, because this is very similar to the same thing that happened to Moses. It, 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 and... Moreover, you might be on the ambush team. You might be on the, you know, it was probably pretty humiliating to be on the team that got to run away from the people of AI a second time. Even, even, even for the ambush, you get to be part of the of the bait and switch team. You know what? There's there's some not glamorous jobs when it comes to fighting in the warfare of God. You know what? Sometimes these festivals they get real hard. There's not many of us here. To, to, to do the actual work. And sometimes it's not very glamorous to lug totes and totes of tracks around and that be your single contribution to the whole thing. But you've done your job. You've done you've done you've done you've you've went out and you've fought the battle. A lot of times in this class or recently when it's been well before you know there were no festivals, uh, when when it was when it come festival time, I tried to prep this class. We needed what what was the thing? We came up with banners, we came we had a plan. We, were, we, 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 we prayed about it, we, we, we looked at the finances, we, we did our research, we had a plan of attack. Now, we, there, there, was no, there was no battlefield to fight on, unfortunately, but we had a plan. We knew what we were going to do, and you know what? And I said, we need to lay out a schedule, did I not? We, I said, we need to come in at specific times so that we don't wear each other out. And I bet it would have been real stinky to be uh, the lunchtime crew, because it probably meant you weren't going to get lunch. But sometimes when we're when we're doing these things, when we're trying to fight together as a church, when we're trying to be a fighting unit, just like the sin of Achan affected everybody, your workload, your level, your battleship acumen directly affects everybody else in here. I think in this class before I've talked about the phalanx before. It's a, 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 a Greek battle formation. They were almost like ancient tanks. They would get, and they had, some of them had interlocking shields. You would get, you would line up, and you would interlock your shields with your, with your, with your side mate, and a lot of times they would have a spear out. And so you would have, when you were on the battlefield, you just had this wall of solid steel or brass just marching up to you, prickling with spears. There were some people in the back lines that would hold their shield up over their head to prevent arrows from coming down. You were just this solid block of metal charging onto the battlefield. But if one person dropped out of formation and got hit by an arrow, 
decided, I'm not going to hold my spear and shield up. I'm going to take my short sword out of its scabbard and stab this guy that's close. The whole thing fell apart. Because if you went down, the side flank of the guy next to you was completely exposed because now he doesn't have a nice shielded wall in front of him. And he gets stabbed. So when you're not doing your job, when you're not in your place, when you're not doing the best you can on the battlefield of life and for this and for the Lord and for this church, you are you're not failing yourself, only yourself. You are failing yourself. You're not failing only yourself. You're not failing only God, but you're failing every person you see around you. You're letting them down. And this is not just like a guilt trip. It's like, well, I need to now, uh, Brother Adam got on to us. Now I need to go and try to find something to do so he doesn't harp on us next week. I'm not trying to harp on anybody. I'm just saying whatever your your God-given goal is, whatever your God-given work is, and we all have one, and I've stressed that in this class more times until I'm just about blue in the face on saying it. Whatever it is, Find it. Get in it and do that work. And do it to the best of your ability. Do it, do it, do it, do it as hard as you can go because um, people are counting on you. People are relying on you. Uh, so they take the city. Um, and only the cattle and the spoil of, uh, of that city uh, Israel took for prey unto themselves according to the word of the Lord, which he commanded Joshua. And I think it's very interesting. They get spoils this go around. If Achan had just waited... <laughs> If Achan had just hung on a second, he would have gotten the things that he wanted according to the word of the Lord. Instead, him and his household and all that he had are under a pile of rocks. Think about that. Think, think about our, our zealousness so much often is not for spiritual warfare. Our zealousness, so more often than not, is for things. For money, for houses, for cars, for uh, for land, for any number of things. For gadgets, for gizmos, and, 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 and toys. We're all susceptible to this because we all still have a robe of flesh that we're forced to, to lug around day after day, week after week, month after month. And I'm not saying, Brother Larry, tomorrow you should just go quit your job. And, and and become a full time. I mean, if that's what the Lord wants you to do, please do. But but also, I'm that's not that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying for all of us to start uh to start living like uh, hobos and 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 well, if the Lord blesses me with some food today, I guess we get it. Otherwise, we all go hungry. That's not smart either, because the Lord the Bible's very clear about a man that won't provide for his household. What I am saying is this: that should not be our total focus. See, it was Aiken's total focus. Aiken got caught off. He was in the battle. He was fighting, and he said. I deserve reward now. I've said very often, I don't believe in the Freudian idea of, you know, the id and the superego and ego and all that other stuff. But there is a part of man that I, I think it's the id that Freud describes it as. And I don't, again, I don't agree with Freud. So anybody listening, I'm not, I don't, I don't agree with his idea. But I think he described it as, it's the part of you that says, I want, I want, give it to me now. It's almost that child, that childlike aspect that we are, we, we are taught by our parents to suppress Give it to me now. That's your flesh. I don't know. I don't know what Freud or any psychologist wants to call it. That's your flesh. It's the part of you that morality, it, 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 whether taught or you know, or re, re, taught by your parents or repressed by your spirit, if you're saved, it's that part of you that just wants. And Achan was like, I want reward now. I fought hard in the Battle of Jericho. I want reward now. Uh, patience is so important. Long suffering, I believe, is what they call it in the New Testament, where you just just hang on a minute. Rewards will come, and I will say this: and <laughs> me and Jared were talking at the at the top of at the top of the hour with this uh, with the stream. We were looking for a verse to put on the Facebook for the uh, for the Facebook side of our stream. If you're not on Facebook, we do have a Facebook page. Um, we were looking for a verse, and it says, uh, all things work together for good. And Jared said, that's where most people like to end that sentence. For good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. We we just assume that just because that we're doing, that, that we show up to church two times a week, that we, that we do some festivals for those of us that teach and preach, that we preach or teach 
on a regular basis that we now now we now we deserve the blessings of the Lord. That's not how that works. That's not how it works at all. And Achan found out that's not how that works. We don't get reward when we say so, but if we're just patient, if we just wait, the, the things may not, not come in this life. And, and if you're patient, I can't promise you that one day a, a Lamborghini is going to fall out of the sky right into the drive of your house. It's just that the, the odds of that happening are infinitesimal. I'm not saying they're impossible. I'm saying they're infinitesimal. But your rewards in heaven are going to be great. The rewards for the people here, I wonder, Ai was a small city, but I wonder if the goodly Babylonian garments and the gold and the silver and all the things that Achan taken, if there if there wouldn't have been an opportunity for him to receive fourfold if he had just been patient. If he just waited on the reward. If he if we we need we need to set our focus a little bit higher. Then what we, 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 and it's so easy to get distracted here because there's a lot of pretty light. We're like, you know, like those fish down deep in the ocean. They see a light and they're attracted to it. There's so many pretty lights around. And it's, aha, oh, oh, look at over here. Look at the TV's doing this. And then, and, and, uh, oh, look over here. Fireworks and sparkle. We're, we're very easily distracted. We're, we're, we're like squirrels. Uh, we're, 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 we're easily allured away from the world. Broad is the gate. You know, those broad gates in those ancient cities were full of marketers and all, you know, people hollering up, oh, get your oranges and stuff over here. Get your, you know, there's meats hanging over here. And it is, uh, I'm sure it was, it was, a, it was a, a thing to behold. I've been in a big public market like that, the one down in Mexico, and it's, it, it's kind of like a sensory overload. There's a lot of stuff going on there. It's the narrow way that's harder to walk on. It's the narrow way that yields results. Let's continue. Um, and Joshua burnt Ai and made it a heap forever, even a desolation unto this day. And the king of Ai, he hanged on a tree until eventide. And as soon as the sun was uh, down, Joshua commanded that they should take his carcass from the tree and cast it into the entering end of the gate of the city and raise thereon a heap of great stones. And, and uh, that remaineth unto this day. And Joshua built an altar of the Lord God of Israel and Mount Ebal, and as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of whole stones, which had, which uh, over which no man hath lift up any iron, and they offered upon thereon burnt uh, offerings unto the Lord, and sacrificed peace offerings, and he wrote thereupon uh, the, st the stones a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel, and all Israel, and their judges, and their and all Israel and their elders and their officers and their judges stood on this side the ark and on that side before the priest of the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of God, as well as uh, as a stranger, as he was born among them, half of them over against Mount Gerizim and half of them over against Mount Ebal, as the Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded before that they should bless the people of Israel. And afterward he read all the words of the law and the blessings and the cursings, according to all that had been written in the in, in the book of the law. And there was not a word of all uh, that Moses commanded, which Joshua read not before the congregation of Israel, and uh, with the women and the little ones and the strangers that were covenant among them. Now, you can say this last part, it's like, well, there's no application there. It's kind of like an epilogue to this little short, you know, narrative, if you if you want to call this a narrative. Um, but there is some, some stuff important here. First of all, Joshua reestablishes the law in a new land. First time this has ever been done. They're on a new battlefield. They, they, they get new stones that no man has ever set metal to. Basically, they were unwrought. They were, they were boulders. They were misshapen, uh, lopsided rock, all of them stacked. And then upon them, he writes the law. Now, my assumption is there was not a heap of stones large enough to contain all of Moses' law, uh, because Joshua goes on to read that. My guess is he wrote the Ten Commandments on those rocks, um, uh, because that is the, the core of the law. Uh, and then he goes on, and I think he, I, this is my reading of this, he reads the Pentateuch. From Genesis to to Deuteronomy, he re, he reads he reads the entire word 
of uh, uh, he said because the blessings and the cursings, he get, he gets all of it out there and he lays it out before the people. Now this is an important thing for us to pull from this chapter is when we're done with the battle, it's time to rest. The Lord instituted a day of rest for a reason. He knew that we couldn't handle constant, either spiritual or physical, labor for an intensive amount of time. We have to rest. And so God I, God didn't need a rest, a day of rest. When he created the day of rest, that was for me and you. I read somewhere that the, um, I believe the it was either the communist Chinese or the communist Russian uh, you know, because over in Europe, they're on the Dewey, the, the decimal system. Everything's based on tens. And over here, everything's, you know, inches and meters and ounces and everything else. Uh, uh, so we, uh, uh, we're we a little bit lopsided. And we also have a seven-day week, which descends from the scripture. And they decided, no, so we can standardize everything. We're going to go on a, I think it was, it was a ten-day week with 20, they, they changed hours and minutes too, if I'm not mistaken. They, 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 yeah, they, it was, it was, it was a. Cra but you know what happened? People started dropping dead from exhaustion because they weren't getting work, because they weren't, they, they weren't getting rest. We're built for rest, and this is what this is what this is here. For the example, for the modern day Christian, this is your day of rest. This is coming to the house of the Lord and hearing the law read. Why do we need that? Why do we need to? If we're, I would say we're a fairly studied group. Most of you could come up with. Uh, defenses for your faith, I would say. If you can't, uh, I've been really wasting my time these last couple of years. Um, we're, we're, we're alert, so why do we keep coming back and doing this every week? Well, first of all, we're commanded to. We're supposed to be here every week. Uh, but further still, we need that rejuvenation. We need rest. We need Brother Larry, our Joshua, if you will, not to elevate him or, or not elevate him, depending on how he feels about Joshua, uh, um, any higher or lower than he should be, but we're here to hear him divide the word for us. That's what Joshua did. He said, in case you've forgotten, this is why we're doing this. Here are the blessings. Here are the curses. Let's reestablish the law in our minds and in our hearts so that we remember this is our day of, this is your recharge. I know that I say every, uh, at least, every other time that we come that we need to be studying on our own when we're outside of church. It is your it is your power bar, if you will, as you're trying to make it through your week. But here's where we feast. We all, I would say there's not a person in here that would say that they hate a buffet. Buffets are good. Buffets are real good. They're, they're, it's a smorgasbord of everything that you could possibly want. They have pizza, they have steak, they have macaroni and cheese and mashed potatoes. It's just, just delicious. And the same way that my flesh, at least, feels about a buffet is how your spirit should feel about this day. It's a day where you can load up on the spiritual calories. You can kick back and meditate on the goodness that you've received. And yes, probably like me, after you go to a buffet, you're going to die at the rest of the week. You're probably not going to be in the Word of God quite as much as we need to be, but we're still digging in there with a diet. You know, you take in some calories, but not enough within... Boy, when Sunday gets here, let's load up again. It's your day of rest, and that's exactly what these people did. You fought battle. You did well. We completed the plan. This is the last little part of it, is completion of the plan. They went all the way to the end. They didn't stop halfway. They got they got the job done, and then it was time to rest. I think a lot of times we like to lay down in the middle of a job. Well, we're not getting any results, and we're 15 minutes into this thing, so I guess we'll give it up. I'm not going to... This isn't a this is a brag on y'all as much as me, but if we'd given up on the computer ministry a year in, I was telling Jared we got that computer, that one right back there, in 2012. That was eight years ago, uh, and that's where the things here. I mean, we we'd done the radio ministry when we started the church, right, Dad? It's like 20 years ago, 21 years ago. Okay, so it's been 20 years. We had the, we spent 20 years that we've been broadcasting somewhere, and it's been eight years that we've been on the internet. If we'd given up on it on day one, I think there's a lot of people that would still be yet to hear the word of God. Think about the, the time that we can't give up just because the battle seems long, just because the day seems hot. 
We gotta, we got, we got, we gotta keep pushing on. We've got to complete the battle plan. Rejuvenate when you can. When it comes to down time for church, load up on those spiritual calories. Get yourself reset. They sharpen that blade. I'm sure on those days of rest, there was a little bit of blade sharpening going on. You know, the the ox is in the ditch. We've got to, we got to. The, hey, these swords have got to be sharp for Monday morning. Prepare ourselves because the battle, the battle is upon us. The battle, the battle is around us every day. And I think, unlike the battle of AI. We're surrounded on all sides by the world. You know, they were the enemy was surrounded by Israel here, but we're we're surrounded on all sides of the world. We're getting hit on the left hand, on the right hand. We got to form up. We got to everybody get your shields in a lot, put your spears outward, and let's go to war. Do your thing. Do your part of the plan, because I promise you, you will be you will prevail. And that is Joshua chapter eight. Are there any comments, questions, concerns, uh, hate messages? That you want to put out there for Larry raise his hand on hate message. Go on. Well, it, uh, it, it, you know, kind of intrigues me, intrigues me that they raise the law because they could go again with David King Jr. Yeah. Because they could have been like, you know, like they said, they could have been saying that 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 they could we're sitting on our couch and we, we were watching something there and they said that they read the Bible in 24 hours. And it's possible. You know, you have to read nine words a second to complete the entire Bible in 24 hours. Never stop. You can't stop. You can't stop to eat. You can't stop to sleep. can't stop to 24 hours straight. If you can read nine words a second, you can complete the Bible in 24 hours. I bet Jared could do it. Jared, you should try that. That will definitely make your family very happy. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, um... But yes, uh, it, it was it was it was a no short reading, and and to be clear too, he spent some time chiseling as well. So it was probably like a three or four hour ceremony where we were just first hour and a half waiting for Joshua to finish chis chiseling, and then then we're gonna stand and we're gonna read for and and they were standing. This is this was not no sit down service. We got a nice cushy pews upstairs. At least two hours there it doesn't feel like two hours on your feet. All right, any other questions or comments, Jared? Okay, all right, good deal. Any other thing before we go? Thank you, everybody. Thank you for those. If anyone joined us uh, via the, uh, the stream, and we will see you all next week. You are dismissed.